Okay. But I want to start by just talking a little bit about what you may have seen in the news, the event that happened yesterday. Um, I see that Councillor Mercy is here, so she certainly knows and we could not have done it without the support of the city. But yesterday, as the result of an investigation that we began in 2019, we were able to execute over 50 warrants. And that's the biggest number of warrants we've executed in one day. Those included um, third, over 30 search warrants for cars, homes, storage facilities, and bank records, as well as over 20 arrest warrants. And it came as a result of what started in 2019 is some information we had about a group who are self-titled, the Cocaine Cowboys, that were distributing about a quarter of a million kilos a year in the Lowell Merrimack area. And we spent in collaboration with an enormous amount of effort from other law enforcement agencies, primarily the Lowell Police Department and the State Police, literally two, a little over two years, making controlled buys from individuals in that organization, attempting to find our way in with a twofold goal. One was to figure out where all of this was coming from. And secondly, where they were keeping it in the city. And I think what you don't see on TV in those programs is obviously people who are engaged in this kind of a high level operation sort of have their antenna up about people who might be looking to infiltrate them. So it takes a long time and a lot of changing it up not to arouse suspicion and to work your way into the organization and to work your way up the chain in that organization. And so we were doing two things. On the one hand, there would be some street sales by the runners from this group of drugs on the street, and we would arrest those people for those small amounts, but always kind of keeping our eye on those two bigger goals and going upwards. And finally, in October, the end of October this year, we were able to go to a judge, and based on what we had discovered, we could report that like everything else, we had determined that the vast majority of this work was being done on electronic devices. And a judge issued a number of wiretap warrants to allow us to intercept communication on various people's phones. So we began that on Halloween and continued it until the execution of the warrant yesterday. And in addition to the large amounts of various drugs, including cocaine, um, fentanyl, methamphetamine, and Xanax that we took off the street. We took off 11 guns, um, a really staggering amount of ammunition. 10 cars were seized as a result of having been used for the traveling and taking of drugs around that. And while we're still going through everything, we at least as of yesterday afternoon had over $100,000 that we picked up in those various places where we were. So, you know, we, as we said yesterday, both our office, the police department, the city, everybody involved in this are very firm in this resolve that we are going to do two things. We're gonna be doing our outreach and our prevention efforts and all of that, but we are also going to recognize the way that this group was maximizing their profits by how they were cutting and packaging it and what a sophisticated operation this was. And we are gonna continue these kinds of things. They take a lot of patience. They take an enormous amount of resources. But when you look at what we were able to take in yesterday and get off the street, it's an effort well worth making. So that is the piece, and many of you have heard me say this before, that is the piece that only we can do, which is the enforcement side and the prevention by cutting off the supply. And one of the interesting allegations here is that the alleged leader of this operation, Mr. Ariaga, was able to do 
all of this, running this giant operation out of his home. He was in fact running it out of his home because he is on an ankle, allegedly on an ankle bracelet for cases that he has out of Essex, Essex County. So he was where he was allegedly supposed to be, but this operation was being run at the same time. So that's just a piece of the kind of work that we're doing across all of these issues. So I give you that. I'm happy to take any questions people have about all that, but we owe a great debt of gratitude to everybody who supported us in that effort. And the fact that we had about 400 officers who were with us yesterday to execute all those warrants at the same time, because you want to, you know, it's a very coordinated thing, so everybody isn't calling everybody else. Um, and it's very coordinated just to make sure that nothing goes wrong and no one gets hurt in the process of, as I said, executing more warrants than we had ever executed before in a single day. So it was really a commendable operation. All right, um, moving back and beginning as we always do with our numbers, we see that and it's interesting in looking at the last four years, we are right now back to a place where we are slightly below where we were in 2021, at this point, you can see the map that Nora has just put up. Um, we are still seeing those non-suicide fatal overdoses happening sort of in the same places we have seen before. Um, I am hopeful it has been relatively quiet. I am hopeful that we will make it to the end of the year um, down from where we were. You know, it's it's interesting. We were down, very far down in 2019. We went even further down in 2020. Um, last year was a bad year, and that is true across the state. Our numbers went back up for the first time in about 10 years. Um, and I'm hoping we can start that downward trend again. So we'll have you can take a look at all of that and sort of see we've got the same, what you know, what we refer to as that elbow of the county, the Medford. Malden area, Lowell as well. But again, they're scattered all through. There's a concerning scatter of overdoses in the southern part, the Marlboro, Framingham, that area of the county as well. So the work continues on all fronts. So let's go to our presentations. Our first presenter today um, is Charity Ryder, who's here with us from a program which just does as so many things that we hear about here, but really a program that does amazing work. On, she's from On the Rise. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, On the Rise is a day program in Cambridge that serves homeless and formerly homeless women and transgender non-binary individuals. And most of the clients from On the Rise are people who don't fit the qualifications for other programs. For example, they might not have a firm, they might not be in a place to make a firm commitment about leaving an abusive partner. They might not have a treatment plan for their mental illness. They might not be ready yet to say, I'm gonna to try to address my addiction. And they might have a criminal record, which would keep them from being involved in some other programs. And I think one of the most interesting things about On the Rise is it really does meet people where they are. And it recognizes that homelessness, and you know, as we slide into the winter and we're thinking about this again, it, it's about more than just not having a house. It's a whole web of challenges and they can come from traumatic events like childhood abuse or domestic violence. It can be a health condition like a chronic illness, a physical disability, mental illness. And then just all of the systemic issues, you know, poverty, racism, gender discrimination, transphobia, and destructive coping mechanisms that have led them in many cases to either legal issues or addiction issues. And in a typical year on the rise serves close to 500 women and trans non-binary individuals. They provide meals, they provide advocacy, and they provide community. And I think for so many of these programs, and all of you know this, one of the big pieces is the dignity in which it's done. And On the Rise is fortunate to be in a beautiful Victorian house in Cambridge doing all of this work. So I'm really grateful that Charity's taking time to be here with us this morning, and I'm gonna turn it over to her. 
Wow, thank you so much. I feel like you did my presentation. <laughs> no. Um, so lots of things that are important to know about On the Rise were said, but I do want to just highlight a few, a few of those things before I talk specifically about how the challenges our folks um, struggle with related to substance use and um, accessibility um, to some of the things that are helpful to people when they're struggling with those things. So um, On the Rise was founded in 1995. Our founder was the um, director of the Harvard Square Homeless Shelter. And in that role, she was talking with folks who stayed there, particularly women who said, there aren't enough services to help us, right? Um, there still are, I feel like, more services for unhoused um, men identifying folks um, and not as many for women identifying people. And so I think at that time there was even fewer services. And so Katya really listened to what people were saying. Um, and they said, we really need a program where we can just come and be who we are as we are and really um, take it slow and, and build relationships and do the things that are necessary to meet some of our goals and our challenges. And so Katya found it on the rise. It was exclusively um, a street outreach program in the beginning. So people were on the streets of Cambridge and Somerville mostly um, talking to folks and uh, you know understanding what the needs were. So in 2000, we moved into this Victorian home that was described um, and we've been here ever since. And part of our model, our, our focus really is about building long-standing, trusting, mutual relationships with the folks that we work with. And part of that is really creating an environment that is supportive of that. So the program is housed in an old house. It has a kitchen. It has a bath, a couple of bathrooms. It has a bathtub. It has a room where people can watch TV. It has a place where people can sleep. We have computers. People can get their mail here. They can do their laundry here. And it really serves as a home base and a home in a sense for people who don't have a home outside of on the rise. Um, and in doing that, I think it really creates a sense of safety and belonging for people, which is really what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a community. Um, and so a lot of the work that the advocates, we have a team of six advocates who work very closely with the participants and they're really trying to build mutually trusting relationships with our folks so that we can then help them leverage those relationships where we can and leverage relationships with folks like you um, in the community to connect them to the services that they want. Um, and the key things about our approach are really that people get to decide how they want to use our services. So if somebody wants to come in and just sleep and eat, which are basic things that we all need to do, that's okay. Um, if they come in and they want to start applying for housing, those are things that we're going to help them do as well. We also help people access treatment for substance use or mental health treatment. Um, but really the participants get to decide how they want to use our services. And so sometimes that looks like somebody coming in and taking a nap, but the advocates are paying attention. And so, you know, little by little, we're sort of connecting with them and making, you know, conversation and trying to understand who they are and what they need, um, but really also trying to see them as a whole person and not just the struggles that brought them through the door at On The Rise and like the things that are causing them problems, right? We want to also be thinking about the things that make them who they are. And those we all have those things, right? Like we all have our challenges and struggles and we all have things that we're really good at, things that are important to us, things that make us whole people. And so our advocates are really working hard to understand those things about the participants who come to On the Rise so that we can better understand who they are and what, you know, what strengths we could build on, right? Because everybody comes through the door with something that you can build on. And so really trying to focus on strengths, not so much the, the deficits. Um, and the folks who come here have are typically chronically homeless folks. So they've been out on the streets for a long time, usually. Um, and that in and of itself is traumatic. Um, but people have also lived through incredibly traumatic um, life experiences, often that started in childhood. Um, many people do have social connections and many don't. So some people don't have a big safe, um, um, support network outside of um, maybe the people that they're close with in, in the sort of unhoused community or maybe a few providers. So really trying to create a space where people can feel connected and feel like they have supports. Um, 
people also are struggling with a lot of significant untreated mental health issues um, that complicate their ability to access other kind of more traditional services. So people um, on the rise does not have a sobriety or a sort of requirement for people to be taking medication or to be sort of well in the ways that people might define mental health. Um, and so people can come in here really as they are. And so people are often struggling with those very significant mental health issues and pretty significant um, substance use, um, misuse um, issues. And th so those things combined often make it hard for them to access other services because they get barred or they don't follow through or those kinds of things. And so we're really trying to create a space for them to feel like they can come here and take it at their own pace. Um, almost 100% of the people who come here are in poverty, so they don't have a lot of resources, which plays into their ability to access meaningful help often. Um, and they're just on, in a state of crisis, right? And it affects their physical health, that affects their mental health, and it often is a reason why they um, continue to use substances. Um, so many of our folks are involved in the criminal justice system, right? They are doing things often that are getting them in trouble. Um, substance use is one of them, right? So people who are unhoused are often congregating outside and using and things. And so we are helping folks who find themselves in those situations, trying to advocate to get them treatment if they're interested in that. Um, we also really do work from a harm reduction model though also. So we're not, you know, we're really gonna meet the person where they're at. And if, if that means that what we need to do is connect them to services that can provide them with safer ways to use, we're gonna do that. We work closely with AIDS Action and the Needle Exchange here in Cambridge. Um, and also we wanna be able to be a resource for people who do want to get access to treatment. So we're trying to help people go to detox. We're helping people um, get Narcan trained, certainly. Um, our staff are actually all getting Narcan trained tomorrow um, and really encourage our participants to do that as well because they're the folks who are often with folks on the street who are, who are using and actually need to be Narcan trained and need to have it on them. Um, but really, I think the struggle for folks who are unhoused with substance use is that it's really hard to find meaningful treatment, I think, that is actually long-term enough for them to make a change. Um, there are, you know, most of the folks that we work with have been using substances for a very long time, and the circumstances that have led them to use um, are often still present, right? Those things um, have not gone away. It's a coping mechanism for sure. It's a way to sort of escape the harsh reality of being unhoused and being you know, out in the community all the time. Um, again, not excuses, but these are really legitimate reasons why people continue to use drugs and alcohol. And if, if the lack of access to meaningful treatment is one barrier, but also if people do make strides in that and are able to get into a treatment program that works for them, um, they, don't have a lot, like when they get released or when they're discharged from their treatment, um, they're often returning to the street. And so that, again, is a really challenging thing for people because they're back in the same place with the same people doing the same things. And to stay clean in that environment is really, really tough for folks. Um, and so often there's feels like a revolving door of sort of accessing detox and short-term treatment and then going back out into the street. And so really I see this issue as more of a systemic problem of not having enough housing, which we all know is a problem for folks um, because getting people connected to things once they're maybe have a little bit of clean time under their belt is really challenging. And again, staying clean um, on the street is really, really challenging for folks who have a long history of um, drug use. Um, I also think, you know, sometimes treatment for our folks, often people want to go to a gender specific treatment program, which isn't always available. I know some people don't want to go to treatment programs where um, they're with men. Um, that has certainly been a struggle. Um, and I just think that they're, they don't necessarily feel safe or ready. And I think the thing that we do really well is just really sitting with people and staying with people for as long as they need us to. Um, to decide like what will work for them and what might be helpful for them. 
Um, and this relational approach that we have, I think, is really important because people feel like they can really trust us and they can really tell us the truth about what's happening and what they're doing. I think there's a lot of pressure in some places for, for very good reasons um, that people have to be clean or they have to, you know, uh, be doing things in a particular way. And I think that that can sometimes be a barrier for folks who are really struggling with all of these multiple issues at the same time of accessing those kinds of services. And so the good news, and sometimes the bad news, honestly, is that we know a lot, right? Like we have a lot of information about the people that we're working with. And sometimes that can present challenges, but I think it's it, it, it enables us to really help people in a genuine way because we really understand the picture of what's happening for people. And it's not just what they think we want to hear. And it's not just they're leaving out this huge part of their story um, because that can be really challenging too. Like if you don't have a full picture of what someone's dealing with and what their struggles are, it's really hard to offer meaningful help. Um, so I think the, the dual diagnosis issue is also really challenging for our folks because um, our folks are often bounced out of, you know, or bounced between or the DMH services, because oftentimes if you have a substance use disorder, if that's your really the presenting issue, um, sometimes it's hard to get people mental health services. Um, it can be a challenge. People, you know, there it's sort of like, which is, what's the real issue? And the answer is both are the real issues and both need to be treated. Um, and there need to be, I feel like more programs that are treating dual diagnosis folks because those things go hand in hand. And I think it's really hard for folks who are um, dealing with significant trauma and PTSD and anxiety and depression um, to stop using without addressing all of those issues that um, are happening for them in their mental health as well. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm gonna pause for a second. I saw a couple of questions. I can't really monitor the chat. I don't feel like, and also do this. I can't um, read and talk, but um, the Narcan training that we use is through AIDS Action. So they have, um, and it's actually a virtual training, which is kind of random because you do have to get the Narcan. So you have to get it at a different time, but they can do the training online. And I have actually done it online. I've done it in person a few times too, but I've done it online and it's a pretty, um, it's a good training. It gives an overview of, um, sort of opioids and all the things that we need to know about that. And then it gives um, important information of like how to use the Narcan, obviously. Um, it's free. The I think someone just asked if there's a- Did option. you say it was called adaption? Oh, AIDS, AIDS action. action. Yeah, I can, um, after this, I can send Nora, the contact person, after this presentation. Um, his name is Brian um, and I'm sure they would be happy to offer the training to other folks. Um, I think, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think on the rise of lots of other things. So, so we accompany people, you know, to do intakes at, if they go to a program, like we're happy to accompany them. That's a huge part of what we do because a lot of times the barriers for folks to access services is really that they're scared or nervous to do it alone or maybe don't have the transportation they need to do it. Um, and so our advocates are available for folks to accompany them, right, to go to that first intake appointment um, for a mental health assessment or to go um, to the housing appointment or to go to a medical appointment. Because a lot of our, you know, I think all of us, it's sometimes it's hard to take it all in, right? And for folks who are struggling with multiple issues, sometimes it's hard to retain that information. And also it's scary sometimes to be going to do something that is really hard or maybe that you're ambivalent about doing. Um, Cause I think that um, one of the things that our advocates really do well is, is using motivational interviewing to work with our folks to really try to suss out where they're at in the change process, right? We all struggle when we're having to make some kind of behavioral change or change in our life of like, am I really ready to do this? Do I have the commitment I need to do it? And what are the things that I'm going to have to give up if I do this thing? And what are the things that I'm going to gain if I do this thing? And so really talking about trade-offs, like what, what would it be like for you? Like, how do you envision this happening? And so the advocates are available to have those kind of conversations with people to really understand you know, it sounds like maybe right now we should do X because, you know, you're saying that you don't 
really want to get a therapist right now, but what are the things that we can do to help you um, cope with your mental health struggles or the things you're stressed that you're dealing with right now? And similarly with, with using, right? Like what are, what are the ways that we can help you stay safe if you're not ready to stop using or are there ways that you're interested in reducing the amount that you're using? Um, so having those kind of conversations where we can really understand um, where the person's at, because it's not super helpful if I assume that you're, you want to do this thing and you actually really don't want to do that thing. I can do a lot of work and run around and try to get the things in place. And if the person isn't really committed to doing that or wanting to do that, it's really not going to be helpful. And often what happens is people then feel shame, right? It just, it fuels the cycle of sort of not feeling like people are doing what they're supposed to do, or there's a lot of shame around drug use anyway, right? And they are very much aware of, um, how people see them and view them. And so, you know, if you are too far ahead of the game and down the road farther than the person is and try to connect them to services that they're not ready for, it's not going to be helpful. And often I, I would argue can be harmful to sort of their own um, sense of self and, and their self-esteem. And we're definitely trying not to do that. Um, let's see. Um, so the accompaniment is important. I think that advocates are doing all kinds of accompaniment. Um, we also do, you know, they take people to appointments. We go to court with people um, and can be advocates for people in court if necessary, right? Like um, there are a lot of collateral consequences that come from um, convictions of certain kinds. And so really trying to help people understand what that means to take that plea deal, um, what it means, you know, what the what the consequences might be down the road for you if you take this deal. Um, and again, not saying that they shouldn't take the deal, but just helping people understand what it means and having a real ally and um, an advocate with them when they're in these spaces that are scary and unfamiliar sometimes and um, you know, have have serious consequences for people's lives. And so that's another piece of advocacy that we do is really trying to help um, people through um, their their criminal if there's if they're you know involved in the criminal justice system, really trying to be advocates and work in partnership with with whether they are um, you know the victim of a crime or whether they are the defendant in a case, um, really trying to be advocates. Um, for folks and help them understand the process, if nothing else, you know, and, and really working in partnership with um, the prosecutors and, and the defense attorneys um, when, when we can. Um, we also work with a lot of folks who are struggling with complex medical issues, right? Like all of this stuff goes hand in hand. I think being homeless really takes a toll on your, on your body. And so a lot of people age, you know, the death rates um, of folks who are unhoused are I should probably know the statistic. I don't off the top of my head, but it is it is staggering um, how much higher it is than the, than the general population for people who are unhoused. They're they're weathering a lot of really challenging things, and I think the pandemic only intensified that. Um, you know, people. I know it, we can all think back to what that was like in March of 2020 to not really know what was happening and not really knowing what we were going to do. And if you can imagine like not having a place to go um, to shelter in place, um, that was really, really hard and continues to be really hard, but people had nowhere to go. I mean, they literally had nowhere to go. I mean, they were, they lived their lives in outside and in, in public. And, you know, when the world is saying you can't be in those spaces anymore and you have to be sheltering in place and you have no place to do that other than an emergency shelter, which is great, but none of us knew what we were doing at that time, right? So none of us knew how to do it safely. And so I think people are still reeling from that. And as a result of the pandemic too, a lot of services went virtual. And so for folks who are unhoused, many of them do have phones, but many of them didn't know how to use Zoom, didn't really know how to, I mean, you know, none of us really did, let's face it. In 2020, we learned quickly, but um, and people don't have private spaces. So like telehealth is great if you have a place where you can shut a door and have a therapy session with a therapist in the privacy of your home or your office or wherever. But when you're unhoused, accessing those kinds of services that I think many of us feel like have improved our lives or made those things easier actually um, are not 
that easy um, because they don't actually, they live their lives without a lot of privacy. So um, that's another thing that On The Rise tries to offer is space for people to do that. On any given day, there's probably one or two people who are either on Zoom for court and an advocate is sitting with them while they're, while they're in their court session and or they are using a space in the house to meet with their therapist or their doctor through a telehealth appointment. Um, and so that has been a way in which we've really, I mean, I wouldn't have ever dreamed that that was something that we would be offering people, you know, pre-pandemic, but it's been a great um, way that we can support people um, in, in this sort of virtual world that we're kind of all now living in somewhat. Um, and, it, you know, still there are things that are really challenging for folks, though. Um, I don't know if anyone's tried to renew their driver's license or had to do anything with the RMV, but it is a whole thing. Um, I need to renew my driver's license and I literally feel so grateful that I was able to finally get an appointment by setting my alarm and getting up at 7 a.m. when the RMV releases the appointments. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot. And so folks, you know, and again, being unhoused, um, getting, ID, getting an ID in general pre-pandemic was a whole thing just because you have to have a birth certificate or an ID to get an ID, you have to have ID to get ID basically. And so folks who we work with often don't have those things, right? They've lost them or whatever has happened. And so that's another huge piece of advocacy that we have done with folks is really just getting documentation that they need for all the other services that they need to access. Um, but the ID thing, you know, you have to have an, well, you don't anymore, but essentially you do kind of still have to have an appointment at the RMB. So that's like another way in which we're trying to assist people um, just doing those kinds of um, systemic things. Um, but I don't know if people have questions. Um, I would love to hear them if you do. Uh, Candace. I don't really have a question. I'm sorry. I just have more of a comment and um, the harm reductionist in me couldn't like not say this. Um, at the beginning of the meeting, we talked about like the big drug bus. So I just wanted to like remind everybody that with big drug bus is usually an unintended consequence of over, excuse me, of an uprise in overdoses because the drug supply has now changed and people need to resort to going to other drug dealers. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, put all the outreach workers and everybody that works with active addicts on alert that usually when a drug bus comes, this is when we have the increase of overdoses. So I'm sorry, but I just, I needed to say that. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. And um, I think, I think that will also be relevant to some of the stuff that Tracy may be talking about next uh, in our next presentation. Um, Charity, I just, I was wondering and you, you touched on it a little bit in terms of lack of privacy and, and um, but it would seem to me that for folks who are on house, there are simple logistical problems that folks who are housed, who have a place to receive mail, who have, um, I guess, theoretically, they have more of a network or more connections um, but, but what, what are some of the specific logistical kind of hurdles that being unhoused places in front of a person who's trying to either access services or just stay safe until she's ready to access services? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good point. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, you know, there are so many. Um, I think being unhoused is a full-time job. I think people don't really understand that. I think people say like, why don't you just get a job? Um, or why don't you do X? And I think that um, a lot of folks don't know where they're gonna sleep tonight, right? Like they, that has changed a little bit since the pandemic. There are more shelters that actually have saved beds. Um, some of the shelters that used to have lotteries no longer do so right now, but who knows what will happen moving forward. Um, but a lot of space is taken up in people's brains and, and minds about survival, right? So where am I gonna eat? What am I gonna eat? Where am I gonna sleep? What time do I have to be there? Because no shelter has the same time that you have to be in. So like, if I don't get a bed at Woods Mall or, you know, if I don't get a bed at St. Patrick's, which is a place where a lot of our folks stay in Somerville um, or I can't get in there, 
where am I going to go? How am I going to get there? People don't always have transportation. Um, some people do, like some people have access to a tap pass or a bus pass, but a lot of people don't have um, access to transportation. So um, getting from Somerville to, to downtown Boston to Woods Mullen is not insignificant if you don't have money to take the bus or the train. Um, and so I think <clears throat> that in and of itself, just the sort of survival is a huge hurdle for people. And it's very anxiety provoking and stressful, which fuels a lot of the things that I talked about before, right? It fuels people's, people need to cope with that. So some people's way of coping with that is to use drugs. Um, some people, you know, their mental health suffers and they are not well and they can't take care of themselves in the ways that they want to. Um, and so I think that and there's lots of requirements for programs. Some places you have to be sober. And so if you're not a sober person, that's not an option for you. Um, some programs are co-ed and people are not comfortable with that. So they don't want to access those services. Um, and I think just the fact that people have to be in, I don't think that everybody, not at every shelter, but a lot of shelters, like at St. Patrick's, people have to be in at three o'clock in the afternoon and you can't leave after you come in. So that kind of limits your ability to actually try to find a job or to go to therapy or to go do the things that you need to do because I don't know, you have from nine until about two to do those things. And sometimes that will work and sometimes it won't. And so I think just sort of the, the, the way that the things are structured is often a barrier. And I don't think it's intended to be that way, but I think that's the that's the outcome or the, or the impact of those kinds of rules and things. And I think another thing that is, is I think overlooked a lot of times is that folks who are unhoused, their lives are very controlled, like, or, or, or like they're very much told what to do, where to do it, how to do it, what time to do it, when they can do this thing, when they can't do this thing. And so one of the things about On the Rise that we try to do is really have it be, you come in and you can do what you want to do without having to ask, right? You can take a shower. I mean, there's a list, of course, there has to be a little bit of order, but like you don't have to, there's not a lot of hurdles to jump through when you come to On the Rise. You can come in and really feel like this is your home and, and do the things that you need to do without having to ask. And, and we do actually have a bathroom that has a bathtub, which people talk about all the time about what a meaningful resource that is because most of the folks who are unhoused don't spend any time alone. You are good, bad, or indifferent. You're with people all the time. Um, you're sleeping in a shelter where it's a dorm setting usually. And so if your neighbor snores, you're probably not sleeping a lot, or you know, you're worried about people stealing your belongings. And so to be able to go into a bathroom and shut a door, even if you just take a shower, but to know for 30 minutes that you're not gonna have to talk or interact with another human being is like an incredible thing that people talk about here. They feel like that is so valuable to just be able to be alone um, for a little bit. Um, and I think Nora, you touched on folks who are housed. And I think there's also this idea that housing is the answer and it certainly is a huge uh it's a huge stepping stone to better well-being and also for our folks many of them who have been unhoused for a really long time um, and are struggling with lots of issues getting housing is a really 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 challenging time for them um, when they first move into their apartments because they're living alone um, most of them are, have subsidies and so um, unless you have a family member or a partner or something that you're going to put on your lease. If you have a Section 8 voucher you're, and it's for you, then it's just you who can live in the apartment. And so people are living alone, maybe for the first time in their lives. Um, maybe not, but also maybe they don't want to live alone. Maybe that's not something they really want to do. And so oftentimes we have found that when folks move into housing, it's a really vulnerable and um, critical time to have a lot of support. And so that's something that I didn't talk about that I should have is that we have a housing stabilization program called Keep the Keys. And so it's embedded in our safe haven program, which is the drop-in program, but we have advocates who do both um, working with unhoused people and house people. And that's very intentional because when folks, um, I don't know, probably about 15 years ago, uh, started talking with us about um, when they transition into <clears throat> housing, excuse me, Often the agencies that they were working with, they would have a worker who helped them find the housing. And then once they moved into the housing, they would get a different worker who would do this sort of stabilization services. And 
there's nothing wrong with that model at all, except that the folks that we were working with said, I actually don't want a stranger coming to my apartment. I want to know the person who's coming to my apartment. I want to know that they know me and understand me. And so we created the Keep the Keys program to really offer that kind of support. So the person who's coming to visit you when you move into your apartment is somebody that you've known and you've built a relationship with in the safe haven while you were unhoused. And so <clears throat> when people first move into housing, we really do try to offer a lot of support for people so that they, you know, so that that anxiety and stress can feel normalized. I think it, most people feel it. Most people feel like this is, I should feel happy. I should feel elated over the, over the moon that I have this house. And people do feel that, but they also feel scared and they feel isolated and they feel nervous. And they also don't have to spend their whole day trying to find somewhere to stay. And so wherever you go, there you are. It's like all the things that were problems when you were unhoused are still there and often you have more time to think about them and sit with them by yourself and that can cause people to relapse that can cause people to have a mental health crisis it can cause lots of things and so really want to be available to people to offer that kind of support that they need um, to maintain their housing right because we want people to feel like they can stay where the, where they are. Um, and so that's a lot of the work that the advocates are doing too, is really offering a lot of support for folks. Yeah, I see a hand. Rita? Yes, uh, thank you very much. You can hear me, right? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Thank you so much. It's, you've been very helpful and it's a wonderful presentation, but I might've missed something. Are, th are there any opportunities for people that are housed there to sleep there overnight? No, that's a good point. I should have said that in the beginning. We do not have anybody sleep overnight here. It's just a drop-in program during the day. Okay, that's um, what I wanted to clear up. Yeah. And, and about how many people would you say drop in on an average daily basis? I would say about 30, usually. Okay. Anywhere between 20 and 30. Okay, thank you so much. A great yeah. job. And we need more of what you do. Thank you oh, so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, I could talk and talk and talk, but I think I can stop now. Any other questions or thoughts or comments? Mary? Andy, that was great. Thank you so much. And I just, as I said, have so much respect for the services that you have at the program. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. A pleasure. An honor. All right, our next speaker. We are fortunate to have with us Dr. Tracy Green from the Massachusetts Drug Supply Data Stream. And MADS, as it's called, is part of the Opioid Policy Research Collaborative at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis. And it's one of the state's responses to align with the Harm Reduction Commission's recommendations. And the goal of MADS is really to learn more about the local illicit drug supply, to better inform how public health responds and to do public safety responses. So just as a mention that what someone just said about, you know, when you have a big drug takedown, people are gonna go someplace else. And we know that more timely and extensive sharing of that kind of data is critical. And so too is getting that information to the people who are actually using drugs, the providers who care for them, law enforcement and public health stakeholders. And it saves lives. You, we've seen that time and time again. Many of you will remember when we first started doing the alert, when we would see bad drugs on the street, there was no question we were able to break the cycle of those rapid fire groups of overdoses as things spread around. And Studies show that people who are using drugs do change the way they are consuming those drugs and take more preventative actions when they know what their drugs might contain. And it also really helps to improve the way that people respond with Narcan or other prevention measures because they know, and I think Tracy's gonna talk a little bit about this, some of the things we're seeing on the street right now actually are probably not gonna respond to Narcan, so it helps the first responders to know that, know what they might see. Um, it better targets the interventions that we have going, like the distribution of the Narcan or the fentanyl test strips, and it quickens the ability to detect and notify about harmful supply-based problems. So, you know, this is really critical, critical work 
um, that needs to happen and does have real time impacts for people. So I'm going to turn this over to Tracy and I'm hoping she's going to talk in part a little bit about the, um, I can never say this right, xylazine, um, which I think is a really truly scary drug because we don't know a whole lot about it. And what we do know is that it's out there, that it's particularly showing up here in the Northeast and that it probably is not responsive in an overdose situation to Narcan. So that's something we've got to be thinking about. But Tracy, this is so timely to have you here and I appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Thank you so much, Dearan, and, and, and for the invite to come and speak with everyone um, today. I prepared some slides because a lot of um, what we're, we're talking about, a lot of different things and um, can be helpful to visualize um, the kind of the process and what we're all Kind of doing with MADS. Um, so I'll just bring them up right now and um, launch this. Okay, great. So feel free to, um, I'm, I'm not good at uh, multitasking on this, so I'll probably just um, go through the slides and then maybe we can chat a little bit at the end. But um, but I appreciate the, uh, the conversation that we were having earlier. Um, Candace's point about the drug bus and Charity, your amazing work and um, on the rise. There definitely are um, important, this particular service is one that is absolutely, uh, we see in the research data from other countries where this has been going on for a lot longer, but the services are much more likely to be used by people who are extremely vulnerable to the drug supply and the nuances of the drug supply. Um, and, and that is often um, people who are homeless and unhoused. Um, and so they also benefit greatly from these services as do multiple layers and, and all of us by the information. So. So just by way of introduction, I'm an epidemiologist. I'm at um, Brandeis, where I lead the uh, Opioid Policy Research Collaborative, and I'm a public health scholar. I, I do research in harm reduction. Um, a lot of that has been evaluation and expansion of the community drug checking program in Massachusetts, which is the only statewide program in the country that is like this. We have 16 sites now. Beverly just came on um, actually this week. I'm also a scientific advisor for CDC and FDA and the larger overdose response strategy for HIDA. So I'm happy to see some HIDA friends here too. Um, but this is really because so much information crosses uh, local, national, regional and um, uh, approaches and that have health implications, but also public safety implications. So, um, <clears throat> just sort of some, some background. Um, several years ago, I was sitting in a presentation, uh, actually a Haida based presentation about what was happening in Ohio, and they depicted some of the lab tests on confiscated drugs, seized drugs, which is typical of like state police or other entities. In this case, it was Ohio. Um, and they were showing over time that their um, real time data of drug seizures um, showed a, a large increase in um, overdose, um, in, in, in uh, carfentanil rather, that tracked really closely onto overdose deaths. And the overdose deaths, of course, far preceded that increase as well. Um, and then after um, the carfentanil reduced from supposedly from drug seizures and, um, and things that were interventions at its high level, um, that the deaths reduced dramatically too. And one may look at this and say, wow, this is a really great source of information and these data are so important. For me, it makes me wanna cry because it means that people were arrested and their drugs were um, very large scale, likely a community was affected by that arrest. A family lost a, a member to um, the incarceration system that um, way too many people died to get to this point where we can say there's a correlation of 0.7 and should, we should be doing more seized data and, and, and death data collection. So instead, I think um, the idea that this drug supply is this big black box um, felt like a place to work a lot harder um, so that people don't have to suffer a death or a hospitalization or arrest, um, just to have something be informative to our strategies and approaches. Um, so because it's this large uh, determinant of have indeed um, drug-related harm um, and death, and that we can change our approaches based on that information, especially if it were more specific and complete, um, and, you know, this would be a possible strategy to focus our efforts. But if we do that through toxicology or forensic labs like drug seizures, those systems are already extraordinarily overwhelmed by just chain of custody and normal ebb and flow of our society. Um, and then and they um, we risk really overburdening those systems um, and really delaying the results we want to get to anyway to make, make our actions and our changes more um, more appropriate responsive so 
we look back into what people have been doing for a long time in Europe and also what actually we have been doing for a long time in the field. Law enforcement have been um, have had access to and, and has not teams and so forth have had access to tools um, that people can be trained to use and you don't have to have a PhD to learn how to use them. Um, and that is a larger approach that considers the supply as a consumer safety action point. And that's a prevention approach that we haven't yet explored. So that data really are clear in terms of what has happened with drug checking in places like Europe and um, other data points like the dark net even, which believe it or not, is uh, you can do some interesting research there to see how things change in transactions. And so those research really reflect that um, uh, we see a safety uh, improvement in safety of the supply. I mean, that is often because it's more predictable. It's a feedback loop. It's like any other consumer safety product. Once you have nutrition facts on the food that you eat, you change your behavior and you think about your choices at the point of purchase and the point of consumption, the point of preparation for the people you care about. And that improves the overall safety uh, of, of, in this case, the drug supply. But there are other informational points where this information provided to people who use drugs, especially promote um, a degree of health uh, promotion and empowerment that you get through real time and needed information. And that really promotes people's health and dignity um, and their ability to interact with um, harm reduction staff and other service providers um, about helping to increase and improve the where they use, how they use, and their safety. And that is a behavior change that we have. Um, we don't really have those tools until we had fentanyl test strips. We didn't have the ability to do such things. That we can do more. And then finally, this larger engagement tool where we're seeing that um, overdoses are happening in other groups of people that we aren't yet necessarily seeing in our harm reduction and other health services. Folks who maybe have not even touched a uh, healthcare system for some time, if at all. And that shifts to thinking about, well, then how do we reach sort of hard to reach um, populations? Information actually is one way to do that. Needed and interesting information and important information. Um, so that's a way for our programs can use a tool to reach uh, a broader group of people and to engage um, a health service providers or law enforcement in this case, even in different ways. So we think that it's feasible to monitor the drug supply in, in a partnership environment and that this information is meaningful. We know that based on uh, the experience that, that uh, Middlesex County has had, you've seen that a lot of dissemination of results is quicker in this way and more direct to people who are consuming and community who can um, align and um, organized to support. Um, and then you can have the opportunity to triangulate too. I mean, information um, is, is helpful to have other validations. So systems that we built spent a lot of time refining things like syndromic surveillance at hospitals and EDs, even with the drug seizure data. And then people want to know, is this trend leading to deaths? Um, but we have those other sources, but we don't have the information to validate and look back further in, in, you know, to see if they were a leading indicator. And um, at least from the other other literature sources, it's really helpful to see um, that there is more of a, a, a leading indicator for the supply because it's so closely aligned to our drug supply right now and our, our health problems. Um, but community drug checking, just to be kind of consistent with what we're kind of looking at, um, community drug checking is only is really focused on sort of this street level distributor and the people consuming. Um, so we're this information, customs and border deals with car cartels and importers and large scale distribution, much more complex um, public safety and intelligence works at other levels. So what we're talking about and trying to support and encourage is information that can help at the consumer level where people have the greatest risk. And so those individuals um, are, are the ones that we're speaking with and, and supporting in community programs. So this is who we are. Um, the team um, includes an analytic chemist. Um, we do a lot of data analysis and we have advisors who are medical toxicologists so that when we see something like I saw yesterday, I could barely pronounce it, hard pronunciation for some of these chemicals, um, but having a better understanding of what is this like in humans. And oftentimes we don't know what it's like in humans, but they can go to the literature, study that and help at least provide some insight and, um, and we can provide better information to people who are, are already using or have already used this substance. And then Brandon Del Pozo is a former police chief um, and faculty with me at Brown. And so he advises on our first responder communications. Um, this is a Massachusetts Department of Public Health funded on um, your taxpayer dollars, um, federal funding as well from CDC and SAMHSA. Um, and we have partnered with New England Haida from the get-go for this because of the critical and, and really important conversation we have in each community um, to make sure that people feel um, that they are are on 
board with the community drug checking and the information that's there and um, provide the kind of support that's necessary. So just in terms of where, where we are right now, the community drug checking programs, um, the purple ones are our MAD sites that for the Massachusetts Public Health Department sites. Um, and uh, the gray sites are ones that overlap um, with either new, pro new program uh, sites that we're looking to expand. Um, and then the yellow ones are some uh, research funded sites and those are mostly in um, Rhode Island right now. And then um, we've been expanding and be more strategic because we see such differences in drug supply on the west and the eastern parts of Massachusetts. So there's a project looking exclusively at the I-91 corridor to look at distribution and how the drug supply and to encourage programs and harm reduction organizations all along that line to communicate with one another um, and through um, drug checking programming. We don't have any sites in Middlesex County, but that doesn't mean we have zero data. And I'll share with you some of the data that we've uh, gleaned from some of the communities in Middlesex County. We'd love to, um, but we've been working collaboratively um, with uh, neighboring communities. And, and of course, um, drugs are, are uh, no, no uh, town border, no county border. So uh, many of the programs bring, many participants from other programs bring items from, or they may live in that community um, and identify that the sample came from that community, but they may test in a, a site where we have, um, we need drug checking programming already in place. So just a broader overview of what this looks like. Um, MADS is set as centrally with a harm reduction partner site. So that may be a syringe service program, uh, community health center, or an overdose education and loxone distribution program. Um, and from that, we have kind of these spokes. And we've seen, um, especially over, over the COVID crisis, we saw um, a, a grand expansion of outreach. People couldn't come on sites. So much more outreach occurring. And in that case, what we developed was the capacity to um, work with and communicate at just the same way that distribution of um, sterile materials was happening in the community. And sometimes the, uh, and in that same moment, there may be um, removal of some of those used items and disposal. That conversation and outreach, whereas naloxone is being distributed, it was an opportunity to talk about um, community drug checking and offer to check to check um, the substance. We take remnant drugs, so it's often the same sort of um, used cookers and cottons that people are already providing for destruction. But instead, we'd say, "Would you like to test that?" And we can share with you what what was inside of it um, and it help um, with communications and reflect that back the next time they go on outreach. So that's an example of the kind of things that um, generally happen in outreach and can interface within the workflow, which is really important not to disrupt the good work uh, of the community partners um, and add on one more thing, but more to integrate into existing activities. Other groups have definitely have mobile vans and a number of programs around the state have had um, expansion of mobile health vans. And so they incorporate into that drug checking. Um, often that is, um, uh, depending on whether they want the machine on site or they collect on the mobile van and then bring it back to the stationary site and the, and the site um, is where the testing occurs. So a couple different approaches. Um, a number of our partners in North Carolina and um, in, in California are doing mail-based submissions. That was really another kind of thing that we've we've learned. Um, some places, either they don't have the space or the staffing and they may never have the space for the staffing. And that's okay that um, the programs kind of evolved to have drug checking capacity by way of um, providing um, envelopes and then they put um, the used cooker or, or remnant um, remnant from a baggie and then they place that and um, that goes to our DEA control lab um, where all of our submissions go for confirmation anyway. So they kind of skip the machine and skip seeing us um, necessarily or skip the partner site um, and that can be a, um, another kind of prospect for reflecting information, but that's more, um, I don't know, it's a sort of a harm reduction approach, if you will, to drug checking programming, um, give people many paths to the information that's still life-saving. At the base of all of this, we work with and um, collaborate sometimes actively or sometimes more in a, 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 a less active form, but with the police department or a district attorney collaborator and whether they provide samples, and I'll share with you in a second about that, or most sites do not provide samples. Um, but the opportunity to provide samples in all of the community, whether a community partner site or a police department, is part of the pro project that was um, that is the public health and public safety approach. So just sort of big overview, uh, the selection of the samples are collected either and provided in, for testing in the um, partner community organization or with in collaboration with the police department if we're doing police 
police department samples. We scan those all on site. Um, they aren't moved from other places. They either we go to the program or the program has, um, we train and provide the materials and the, the laboratory um, instruments so they can test on site. And then they're packaged, um, uh, officially packaged and sent for confirmation to an offsite testing lab. And that just gives a lot of information that we can't see. The, the tool um, that you can see on the left hand side there is the Bruker Alpha. Um, it's an FTIR spectrometer and it can see a broad range of um, in the light that is emitted um, by any substance um, and it matches it to a library to identify what those in, what those are. It's really great for mixtures um, and we can see things like um, a fentanyl sample may have lactose and small amount of fentanyl and maybe some caffeine in it. We can see all of those things but if it's small and less than five percent um, then we can't see it as well with the um, FTIR. So we couple that testing on site with a tool you already know very well, the fentanyl test strips, because the precision of that is so, so phenomenal that we can couple that together to say the fentanyl test strip is positive. This site had lactose and caffeine. Uh, this probably contains fentanyl and lactose and caffeine. And we can deliver that information directly within um, minutes of having done the scan. And then we'll send that out to the lab and the lab will say, it had fentanyl and lactose and, and caffeine, um, but it may see things that we don't normally see, or it may have an additive that um, isn't in the library or a new drug. And those are the places where it becomes life-saving and really important for uh, a broader approach, as well as for the partner and the, the person that we're speaking with. All of that data um, also gets, um, like on really my team's part is we put it all together in the form of communications um, for the partner programs, as well as for the larger state or um, municipality or county um, to provide more of the trends or the information at that level. We described all this in an open access publication. I'll be happy to send you the slides so you can take a look if you want to go to the nitty gritty, but um, this is the collection of information that describes the full program. But the real important, really important thing I think is in the images here from Brockton Neighborhood Health Center um, where they have a mobile health van um, and they're an example of how the community partner responsibility really is. They have the FTIR at the site um, or they call us and you know, we've gotten eight samples coming, can you come and bring the scanning? And we basically do the scanning on site. The community partner sends out the information or, or from there we send out for testing. Um, we provide the technical assistance um, to them um, and the team will help analyze and support them. For public safety, um, especially for whether that's law enforcement, a, a police chief or a district attorney or, or both, but um, there we make sure that we're all communicating um, through um, uh, either a memo reflecting the support of the program or a memorandum of understanding if there's more um, kind of uh, an active role that the law enforcement want to play. And I'll describe that because it's very important. Um, and then the public safety would uh, partners would receive reports and disseminate either internally for um, if they have a large group um, and have a communication structure that's like this um, or to other first responders, EMS and paramedics are a common um, partner that the public safety um, communications pathways kind of move through. And then uh, some of our, as I mentioned, some of our police departments provide uh, for destruction samples that is um, samples that are already known to be not file, not being um, criminally prosecuted. And those may be, um, uh, we can test those, my team tests those um, in the instances where that's um, of interest. What that relationship looks like when it's formalized, um, I'll give you an example of um, Holyoke <laughs> Police Department in a memo style and a more intensive, um, if you will, or more a longer version, at least, of the memorandum of understanding that we set up between the Berkshire District Attorney's Office and our, in our group. And that allows for the community partner to um, carry out this work for us to provide TA and for the work to happen in the community for this purpose more nitty gritty because it's really important I think. We collect remnant drug samples for this process. So once used cookers, once used cottons, mm -hmm. um, remnant of the baggie, in fact, it's actually too much in the in that baggie as uh, it's pictured. Um, some places have wax holes and stamps more, more Western part of the state. Um, parts of the pill, again, that's even too much. Um, pipes, we're able to test the pipes so the content of the pipe and um, scrape that and or, or at the lab. The amount 
that comes into the testing process is about the um, half a grain of rice or about a grain of rice, so a very small amount. And then for the police department samples, um, when we do those, so we're a very small number of departments and places where we do this, but um, those are only non-criminal cases. They are already in the lineup to be incinerated. They tend to be controlled buys, so they're not linked to any human um, at that point. Found property, not linked to any human. Usually they're found in like a Dunkin' Donuts bathroom or the parking lot at the pharmacy or wherever it may be or on the sidewalk. Um, Non-fatal or fatal overdoses. Again, these are not being used in any sense of the criminal prosecution or otherwise. And we bring in one, um, usually this is if there's um, sub substance left, um, we extract um, that same um, small amount from the baggie or the stamp or whatever it may be so that it mimics kind of personal quantities. Mm -hmm. And the complement of that, why do we do this? The complement of um, our harm reduction partner and community partner um, data and information um, can be complemented by the police department samples to give a broader sense of what's happening in the community because I wish more people were and all the people who may be at risk and um, would benefit from the harm reduction services in, in our respective communities, um, but that may not always be the case. Um, so other parts of the communities um, may be um, places where found property or non-fatal or fatal overdoses may occur or controlled buys, and that can um, give, a, give that fuller picture. Um, and always in the process, we gather information to help um, inform both the lab testing and then when we, if we have an alert or um, when the outreach worker is the one um, reflecting the information back, it can be helpful to provide this sort of information to um, and, and align the kind of services and resources. So um, sterile materials or an additional naloxone kit might be important. Um, so we gather information from people about the sample itself. So we don't gather information from people, we gather information about the sample from people. Um, so if it was a, you know, caused hives or it was purple when it, um, when we, when I add water, um, it was, it gummed up. Those are things that are really important, both for further alerts um, and, and also for those information for testing. We do this by, um, and we learned by, I think by, uh, trial by fire in this instance that um, there's a lot of paperwork that goes into this um, and we wanted to lift um, the burden of paperwork and logistics from our community partners um, if we were to build out more programs. I think this is one of the successes. Um, so we built a, a simple to use application that runs on a, uh, uh, can run a laptop, it um, can run on a phone or a tablet, it can run off, um, off offline, does not have to have access to a, a internet but a way to collect the sample so that it's input in a consistent way. And that makes it easier both for um, when results come in, they are automatically uploaded. When the lab results come in, um, they merge immediately and those results are available literally in real time. So the partner program, the sample collection is a little bit like this. Um, you maybe we saw examples from a mobile health van or um, a, an outreach team or a stationary site respectively at the top there. Um, if there is something that happens and is stored on site, this is part of the agreement that we put into place that um, every on the team who's involved with it sort of knows where, what the process is for sampling. They use street check. It goes in the locked bag. When they bring it back, it goes into a filing cabinet that's in your, your manager's office. And um, if there is no, if there's a machine on site, fine, then it gets tested. If there's not a machine on site, um, then they text us and call us. And um, in the meantime, it sort of sits in this um, kind of environment. So uh, that process looks a little bit like, um, like it has a kit, if you will, a locking sample bag and some sample baggies, flyers um, for people to let people know about the program. Um, and then the, oftentimes the outreach partners or community partner programs, um, when they're out and about, like to have the MOU or, a, or the memo, that the legal um, notice that's on, on their person, both for reference and because sometimes partners and clients, um, participants don't actually believe that this is something that is being offered. So it's part of the, um, that it's legit, um, the trust building that happens um, in offering a new service like this. These are all the equipment, the FTIR, the test strips, we use benzo test strips as well as fentanyl test strips, and hopefully sometime soon, xylosine test strips. Um, the two labs we use are um, the drugsdata.org lab and the Center for Forensic Science Research and Education, which is also what Philly Department of Health uses and New York City Health Department is using. And those are two wonderful medical toxicologists, Dr. Whiteman from Brown and um, Alex um, Kotelski from CFSRE. 
these are kind of data we gather. So I'll get to that little part here. Um, these are from uh, last year and just kind of give you a sense of the, the samples that we end up getting. Um, and here probably we're going to talk a little bit about xylazine. Um, fentanyl is hands down the most common substance that we detect in the drug samples, um, followed by cocaine. And last year we saw quite a lot of xylazine, but as you can see, though it tracks really closely in nearly all, nearly every sample where xylazine, uh, actually every sample where xylazine is present, fentanyl is present, but not all fentanyl samples contain xylazine. If it did, you'd have this line going all the way to the end, right? Um, but this is the kind of the range of active substances we see. And the kind of fentanyl analogs, which um, carfentanyl is one, for instance, you can see that from the pie chart, we haven't seen um, analogs like that, but we do see a very, in a dominant form, um, four floral fentanyl or a parafloral fentanyl, as some people call it, um, which as we came to understand when it came about in um, 20, into 2020 and into 2021, mostly in Lynn, where we first started to see it, um, that four floral fentanyl was important because um, while it's like a lot of fentanyls, um, it has a a different LD50 or a lethal dose 50, which um, just means that um, it, it turns to problematic or toxic fast. So witnessing use where four floral fentanyl is present is really important to be able to respond with naloxone or um, so overdoses may happen, um, fentanyl use may occur, but then the toxic effects may happen very quickly. Um, this is an example of a community level report that we provide um, to the MEDS um, programming. And so this is for Berkshire County, just as an example. And then overall statewide, a big question we always had was, is fentanyl, where is fentanyl and what other drugs that could it potentially be contaminating? Because a little can very easily by accident or um, otherwise from distribution patterns um, find its way into other samples. So um, we've been tracking this for a while now, but um, you can see nearly all the heroin also contains um, fentanyl. And we did see cocaine um, with about 12% of the powder cocaine had a fentanyl present, um, counterfeit pills about 15%. Uh, we did not see fentanyl on the crack samples nor in the methamphetamine samples. So this is important because we have a different sort of whole strategy for it when we talk about contamination of substances. Um, people who use cocaine may not have tolerance and may be very concerned about um, fentanyl and you know may benefit greatly from fentanyl test strips. So knowing how much um, Fentanyl, how much cocaine um, may be affected by fentanyl helps build that strategy. But the big one I think is xylazine, and it's really reminded us, I think that, that um, community drug checking is probably the only way we would ever know that xylazine is in the drug supply because we'd otherwise have to wait for a medical examiner data to come at. These are not this particular veterinary sedative finding its way into the um, drug supply. Um, up and down the East Coast, most kind of unfortunately in the Philly area, um, but we're starting to see more of it in Massachusetts. And so back in 2020, we'd seen it um, in a couple places, but in very, if you will, this is a screenshot of drugs data, which is one of our labs we work with. If you kind of follow along from the bottom up and the ratio amounts, you can see that it was originally kind of tracking below the red line um, in those two communities as you know trace levels of, of xylosine. So perhaps something not particularly um, concerning, but we were just keeping an eye on it because uh, many of us were familiar with xylosine and its horrendous effects on people who inject drugs and uh, people who use drugs in, form, in the form of um, very fast moving um, abscesses and um, uh, acute infections, um, as well as um, incredible sedation that um, can ch change, which may be um, challenges on victimization and sedation in public places and um, uh, loss of circulation to limbs um, if people are sedated and not moving for hours on time. So there's some unfortunate, the worst of which would mean amputation. Um, so the, the kind of importance of xylazine um, and keeping an eye on it was, was definitely on our minds. In 2021, we did start to see it shift upwards. And so as you move from the Boston samples up to the Lawrence samples, we saw more xylosine in the drug supply. And that, and um, over this, this last spring, we pulled um, all the data together to see that um, about a third of the opioid samples, uh, that is heroin, fentanyl, and the um, pain pill, uh, counterfeit pills that we were tracking, uh, can, appeared to contain xylosine. So because of this system, we we're able to take a look at and see the kind of images of what they presented as in their communities. <clears throat> and then also to track over time what we were starting to see, the presence of xylosine. 
we're the final frontier, I think, is adding the quantification or what percent of um, a given drug contains xylosine. So it, uh, if it's, um, you will, it's 20 parts xylosine, is that 20% or is it 50%? And that is a, a, a another part of the laboratory work that we're, we'd like to continue to um, push on and, and um, encourage our public health labs to help us with. So that information also tells us like regionally we see xylosine increasing. Um, so in terms of is it a, a that trace or the next step would be a minor or a major component of the drug supply? Well, we saw that um, there was less that was trace and more that was minor or major. And that was very um, geographic that the western part um, in like Middlesex County, um, Essex County and um, Suffolk County was trying to see more of uh, major components um, of xylosine in the in their um, active drugs. So we started to generate some instead of informational bulletins, um, creating what we call alerts, which um, we try to use them very um, carefully and not to overuse them because alert fatigue is a problem um, in all of our professions in our community, but to really be thoughtful about that. And so uh, an alert like this was set up um, so Rachel and, and Brandon prepared some videos, but these are um, examples of how we try to communicate to um, updating first responders about something like xylosine. And then to the community partners, um, we developed one for providers, so health, um, health departments, um, treatment providers, and community partners, and then um, to the public. Um, in more lay language and with a little bit more visual. It, unfortunately, um, xylosine has some pretty nasty images associated with it that can be really shocking. Um, and so we tried to move away from um, those images and to provide um, illustrations to kind of ground information, but also and because the importance of getting um, abscesses and ulcerations um, treated as soon as possible um, would be the, the goal. So wanting to make sure that the information was clear um, and provided in multiple languages for um, to improve our, our community conversations. I did pull a couple things from Middlesex County. <laughs> so this is from our local community partners um, or people in uh, who have brought their data from Lowell um, to other community partners. Um, I'm guessing many of these came from Lynn, but um, because of Healthy Streets has been um, a link, but uh, here you can see some of the examples. And this was to me really telling, this is back in 2020 and 2021 at a time when I believe their communications in the in Lowell, um, and we were trying to get information like this as much as possible to the local partners, um, because the very clearly we, we were seeing cocaine um, and or rather fentanyl in the cocaine. And you can see this is what it was I was extremely worried about. Um, it didn't appear in the crack, but these examples were all examples being sold as cocaine that absolutely had um, more of a major component of fentanyl. That is what was very worrisome. And so it actually motivated like trying to get this program off the ground as quickly as possible um, in this at that time in Lowell um, and we'll look forward to maybe revisiting that conversation. But um, And then here you can see um, over the summer, we haven't had many samples, but when they come, you can see that xylosine in very large quantity um, or dominance um, of coming upon the fentanyl supply in the Lowell community. And then here's just another one from Cambridge. Um, Couple samples from our um, from people who brought samples from Cambridge. A Hope is a, in Boston is a, um, a very vibrant Mads partner. Um, so I'm guessing maybe some of these came through through there. But um, individuals who you can see here two xylosine on the second sample being um, the major component of a substance that was um, probably sold or or provided as fentanyl. So um, in, until there is a program or if something comes up. Um, we have the capacity through some emergency protocols that we've developed at the state to be able to be responsive if people have um, something in the community they're worried about. Um, and we've arranged for a protocol for um, how to test that. Um, if there's interest in building out a program, there's the reason this is all happening is because there's funding. It is otherwise expensive. There are $50,000 in machine, supplies, um, some staffing. Um, training and then the tox, the confirmation testing that we do is about $150 a sample. So it's not um, an inexpensive undertaking, but thankfully we have, um, we have the really importantly, we have resources in the state to um, build out programs in, in any community and we'd love to have a program in, in Middlesex County. 
And we provide TA to other states um, who are looking to do this or other jurisdictions um, and other community partner sites that um, maybe have been funded through other pathways. So that is it. I will stop here um, and stop my share and I'd be happy to send, take questions or and also send stuff your way to um, help orient to what we've been doing. That was great, Tracy, thank you. People have questions, comments? I'm gonna just take a quick look. There were, there were a lot of comments in the, in the chat. Yeah. Kind of the fact that it's a Narcan challenge, it's kind of gone from zero to 100. Um, stayed pretty low exposure up until last year. Um, lots of yeah. comments on the great work, and the good information. Xylosine is a probably worthwhile topic to, we can talk about another time or I'm, I'm happy to um, send a couple of things. I do think that there's a like a strategy, potentially a, a worthwhile conversation just because we're going between going into the winter. I think it's probably really linked to some of the unhoused strategies too and making sure people are safe. Um, but identifying wound care um, and resources in our communities where you start to see xylosine um, would be really important and kind of just talking about the protocols and and I, I think it's a place where honestly law enforcement and EMS, it, where it could go bad. Um, and so having those conversations kind of very openly um, and making a plan with the community partners so that kind of everybody knows what they're doing and um, on this feels really important. And then when I was doing some research on this originally, one of the things I saw was that because of the, um, the, the way these abscesses look and the way people might present, it can be profoundly off-putting just, and it can be very difficult for first responders to kind of maintain their uh, equanimity and their compassion. I I'm trying to- You said it well. It. <laughs> yes, we got it. So- I so, for staff, it can be really shocking. Just, yes. just um, you know, staff who are working regularly to support um, the community of people who use drugs. But yeah. Mike, Mike, thank you, uh, Tracy. The, the this was really eye opening, very, very scary. Um, I don't know whether you're aware of the um, uh, on, on the local public health uh, angle, whether or not you're aware of the public health excellence program uh, that is now combining. Um, at this point, we have 320 uh, boards of health across the Commonwealth grouped into 50 sharing arrangements. And uh, they're they're funded for the next, well, it's a nine year program. I'd be happy to explore this offline, but you might be able to deploy some of your, some of your data gathering through those grant groups. The, the, the grants are set up so they can actually apply for um, supplemental grants in other areas. Some of them actually have as much as $5 million in extra grants. It's a $300,000 a year grant program for, for, for nine years for the cities and towns. I'd be happy to help connect you with, with that if you want. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. I'll be happy to. Mike is a great, Mike is a great resource. So. And, and um, just one other thing, while, oh, while, I'm, while I'm unmuted, because I was going to unmute in a couple of minutes, just to tell you that uh, Mass Association of Health Boards, um, is working on drafting a uh, template for the for the warrant articles for your cities and towns on how to spend or, or the ability to spend down the opioid settlement funds. Mm. So if you need help with a warrant or a city ordinance, I'm going to draw up my my contact in the chat. Just let me know that that goes to everybody who's on here right now that's working in a municipal setting. We will help you with the template. We know that you have town meetings coming up and you need your warrant articles. We're working on it right now with our legal staff. Yeah, I think this is the oh, weird new, I was gonna say one small weird nuance is that many, many states have, you know, Nixon era drug laws that state that paraphernalia includes things like testing. And so we've had to go in under the hood and disrupt that for fentanyl test trips nearly every state. We've had to do it before for naloxone too. So it's like, you know, there, there, there are many reasons and, and for syringe access and, and other materials that are important for public health, but have been conflated. And I think that um, a challenge and one of the places where to make everybody feel comfortable in what we're doing, like, yes, the machine is testing, like that's what the instrument does. Um, I don't expect any, you know, 
drug dealer or cartel to have a sub, a, a, something like this, a $50,000 machine. Maybe they do, I don't know. But um, but that it's, um, you know, not going to walk, walk around and carry it you know, to McDonald's or something. It's, it's not going to happen. But this particular um, important tool is we want information about the supply. And actually, the more information that's in this about the supply, in some ways, the better, because it means there's less contaminant. Um, so having a um, um, having a, and too often people have no idea what they're selling, which often is the contributes to the sale of, you know, or provision of something you think is powder cocaine, but it actually was fentanyl. And that ends up being part of the tragedy of, um, of the marketplace, if you will, right now is like inability to label and to understand and to communicate. Um, but suffice it to say that, and, and one of the nuances I think that's hard is even drug that is in remnant samples, if collected by a, a, a peer outreach worker to bring back to a site or for a person to bring to a site, um, people worry um, that that is not gonna be okay, <laughs> you know? So we've tried to build in all the MOUs or the memos that understanding like this is a program, this is what the program does, People who work at this program do this thing for this particular purpose. Um, and that's the understanding. Everybody's been trained on how to do it appropriately. And this is what the purpose of it is. And to allow for the program to happen in this environment. So it's a it's a level of tolerance, I think, is really what we put towards. Um, I think there's model laws um, to, about to come out to encourage other states to clarify that more broadly. But in the meantime, um, this is sort of where we're at. <laughs> Um, which is why we, we look for opportunities to collaborate, make sure either the, you know, if the police department wants to participate or if the community wants to participate or more broadly a regional approach. Um, and that's really what ended up happening with Berkshire because it was so, so many little towns that it was really hard, you know, to um, it was a more regional approach. Same thing, I think, in Franklin County, um, we had a similar sort of um, need because in that case, Tapestry Health operated in a regional fashion. So... All right. Thank you, Tracy. This is great. This is really, really good information. Thank you. So we've now reached this really sad part that I was hoping we would run over time and I would be able to skip right over. Um, as many of you know, a lot of the, as I always call Councilor Mercia, the glue that keeps us together, but a lot of what has kept us together here, um, particularly through this crazy pandemic world has been the work that Nora has done um, in connecting all of you and pulling everybody together for the meetings and doing all of that technical piece and all of that and the follow-up and having great questions and stimulating discussion. Um, and, you know, Nora is such a good friend in addition to all of that. Nora and I began working here in the office back in the 1990s. We look exactly the same in case you're worrying about that. Um, and, and one of the funniest parts is our kids are the same age and our kids were just little tights when we started there and they now tell us they're grownups. Um, but we were working then on initiatives around intimate partner violence and elder abuse. And Nora spent about eight years here then and then went over to the AG's office and did about another 10 years over there before she saw the parole board and was able to move on to the Department of Public Health. So she just gave such an enormous amount of time to this work. And after she left DPH, Nora, quote, retired from government service, but I was able to entice her to come back here um, three, almost four years ago. And she really shepherded this group through the pandemic. And she now though tells me that she wants to hang up her virtual hat and go into real retirement. Yeah, I don't know, I'm not with it either. I, I can't figure that out. Um, and, and if any of you follow Nora on Facebook, you will see that she spends way too much time like running and toting food for food pantries and doing all of that kind of stuff. So I think she somehow wants to spend more time on that and more time with her great family. Um, you know, she, I know is grateful, so grateful to all of you for what she's learned here and for the work that she's been able to do and, but, Really, we have such great gratitude to you, Nora, for getting us through all of this, for the partnerships you've kept together. Um, you know, Nora is somebody who really is curious 
And I'm always at six o'clock in the morning and 11 o'clock at night getting articles and all kinds of things. And it's helped us really to be better. Um, and she truly is committed to these issues around substance misuse and behavioral health. And I am incredibly grateful for what you have helped us to accomplish. And since she literally, I could walk to Nora's house from my house, she can't go very far, um, <laughs> but I am so gonna miss having her well, she thinks she's not going to be helping us. <laughs> in this so, but you know, I'm the DA, I can find you. So, so that is, I you can that. feel certain about that. Um, and in her leave taking has as well been as she always is incredibly gracious in helping to settle in um, someone that I want you all to have a chance to meet Madeline Garrett, who's an assistant DA who joined our office this fall to work on community partnerships and legislation and public policy issues. And she is really excited um, to be taking as part of her portfolio, organizing this task force, as well as other initiatives. Um, and she brings that background in law and public policy and outreach. She spent two years at the Suffolk County DA's office before she came to us. And she was in law school at BC. She also worked on Capitol Hill um, in Congressman Moulton's office as an intern for Speaker Pelosi. So Madeline, although she grew up in upstate New York, um, has been here since coming to Harvard and then being at the law school. And she has wisely now chosen to be living in Middlesex County in Newton. <laughs> so I know that Nora is excited. I mean, excuse me, Madeline's excited about this. Incredibly grateful to Nora. Um, so. The legacy goes on, and I'm excited about Madeline taking this over, but Nora, I really am incredibly grateful, and I see all the messages coming in. You've had such an impact, and you know I'm confident that Madeline will do that as well, but I want to give Nora a couple of minutes to change her mind, tell us why she thinks this is necessary. Perhaps Susan and Councillor Mercier could grill her a little bit as to what's up and why she thinks she wants to do this. So Nora, the floor is yours. Oh, that's a dangerous thing. We all learned yeah. from we all learned from Scott Harshberger never to hand the mic over. <laughs> you although I, I think that that Megan is still a co-host to this, so she can just mute me. But thank you for this opportunity. When I retired out of DPH, I was actually very serious. I was going to set up a little consulting gig, but. Um, everybody told me if you're consulting, yeah, you can work 15, 20 hours a week, but some of the hour, those weeks will be 70 hours and some of those weeks will be nothing. And this enabled me to phase out of kind of paid work um, in a way that was really rewarding, incredibly meaningful. And I got to meet all of you. And so I want to thank you. I've learned a tremendous amount. I'm not going anywhere. Um, I am on the mailing list that I'm giving to Madeline. So I will get the invitations for these. I will be at these. I will continue to ask questions, penetrating and thoughtful or otherwise. And um, to the extent that I um, continue to learn about the implications uh, for the most vulnerable people in our communities uh, of substance use and behavioral health, um, I will share them. Uh, I, I sure comes as no surprise to any of you that um, in my own life, I have seen the uh, impact of substance abuse and behavioral health on people that I love. I'm sure there is not a single person here that can't say that too. And the more work we do talking about it, and the more work we do destigmatizing it, and the more work we do thinking about the whole person, not the person who has an addiction or the person who has a mental health issue, but that whole person, the better off and the stronger all of our communities are going to be. And now I'm going to stop so that I don't tear up. So thank you. Thank you. And Madeline, why don't I give you a second to say yes. hello? Oh, yes. Hi, everyone. I, I just want to say thank you, DA Ryan. Thank you, Nora. Nora, impossible shoes to fill. And I'm so grateful to hear that you will continue to be um, so involved with this group and just your leadership here. It's it's so clear the difference you have made. And um, I'm just really grateful to get to dive into this work, to learn from all of you, to get to know you all. Um, so I'm, I'm excited for that. And 
it's nice to meet you all virtually here. As always, um, you know, as reflected in yesterday and the kind of information we were able to share today, we literally could not do this without all of you. Um, you know, as we said yesterday, we do our best work when it is collaborative work. So I, at this season, when we're reflecting a little bit about gratitude and, you know, who matters and what matters, I am truly grateful to be partnered with all of you. And again, thank you to Nora. Um, Madeline will lead us into 2023. I hope that everybody has a very safe, happy, relaxing holiday. Stay well. And we will see you in January. Take care. Merry Love Christmas. you, Nora. Well, Bye, Nora. Nora. Oh, I can't <laughs> believe it. Welcome, Madeline. I I'm lost oh, for words. You. That's unusual. <laughs> that is very unusual, Susan. That has never happened. <laughs> All right. Take care.